there are several uh, schisms in the men's movement, or whatever you want to call it, and I'm not saying there should be or there shouldn't be, but I I like to trace the lines of the schisms, find the edge of contention on which people are divided. And there's one particular edge, one proposition, which is very, very divisive in the manosphere, and yet enthusiastically unifying in the social justice sphere. And it's the proposition, name of the problem. It's a phrase you will have heard many of feminists use in and in an academic context. We must name the problem. The problem is sexism. The problem is racism. The problem is homophobia, transphobia, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy. Is, over, is what they do best. They come up with names for evil spirits they've invented. And then they go around it exorcising them from from the helpless writhing bodies of young adults whereas over here in in the manosphere um we can't even agree on which is the bigger problem to be named feminism or gynocentrism or which problem is primarily to be addressed gynocentrism is is bigger but it's more abstract feminism is probably just a symptom but at least it's concrete so I thought I'd try and be helpful in the abstract, if that's okay. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna offer a visual aid, because I have time to do that now. This is gynocentrism. It's a pattern which many humans have discovered. If you had a couple of hours, you could give a reasonable demonstration of the pattern of gynocentrism, but if you merely chant the mantra, that's gynocentrism, in response to an empirical or inductive point, then your words will sound like they are reverberating from under the echo chamber of a tinfoil hat. This is patriarchy. It's a pattern which many humans have discovered. If you had a couple of hours, you could give a reasonable demonstration of the pattern of patriarchy, but if you merely chant the mantra, that's patriarchy, in response to an empirical or inductive point, then your words will sound like they are dampening from behind the wailing wall of your problem glasses. Now, one can't help but notice the tinfoil hat brigade gets hit pieces written about it and bomb threats all up and down it, while the problem glasses get tenure. But for that very reason, you have to be careful with the word gynocentrism, even more careful than they have to be with the word patriarchy. Because most people, Joe Public and his or her cat or dog, they don't believe in either patriarchy or gynocentrism. They're both just trigger words that make people's eyes roll back and glaze over. And they go, oh God, I don't care about this gender drama and I never will. And you've got to hand it to them. <laughs> That's a pretty good answer. But while we're here, let's address it. If you're geeky enough to make it this far, then like me, you're probably interested in large-scale abstract problems like this. So I'm going to try and describe gynocentrism and patriarchy in the shortest possible way. Patriarchy is the observation that men have more freedom than women. Gynocentrism is the observation that women have more protection than men. I know that's not how most of you would have worded it, but there are crucial elements missing from both descriptions, but perhaps that's the point. Maybe we can fill in those missing elements in both descriptions simply by taking these rather elementary steps. First, let's look at this in cross-section, and then let's do this. Now, a lot of people will look at this diagram and say, this describes gynocentrism. And a lot of other people will say, no, it describes patriarchy. And the only wrong word uttered so far in that exchange is no. This diagram describes both patriarchy and gynocentrism operating in tandem with each other in the same model. And it makes perfect sense. Women sacrifice freedom for protection. Men sacrifice protection for freedom. 
the wilderness is a man's world and the domestic sphere is a woman's world. It's very possible that this diagram describes a property of human nature on a biological level. Perhaps it explains why we survived and the Neanderthals did not. The Neanderthal diagram would look a lot more like this. As long as females are the ones carrying children, there's likely to be at least a thin, sort of, sort of gaseous layer of mostly males around the edge. But that was precisely what made them vulnerable to a species like Homo sapiens. We don't have a gaseous layer. We have a membrane of lionized kamikaze males being constantly replenished by the fusion of the nuclear core or by the self-replicating properties of the cell nucleus. <laughs> you may take this analogy to whichever scale suits you. And I, whether you pin this entirely on biology or entirely on social organization or a bit of both, regardless of the underlying cause, it's scarcely deniable that this diagram does represent how our species is currently operating. With women mostly in the center, somewhat secure but static, and men most around the outside, somewhat mobile but overlooked. You might you might point out that most countries and political systems are operated by mostly men. Therefore, there's a nucleus of men inside the nucleus of women. But just like there are small amounts of women in the outer chromatin, <laughs> there are small amounts of men in the nucleus. It doesn't change the overall picture. It still looks like this on average. And anyway, it's like all the armies are male, and the person in charge of the throne is male, and they're all likely to get their heads cut off. <laughs> the women are not. The pattern is still consistent in that way. But does it make much sense to say the nucleus has no intrinsic power? Does it make much sense to say the nucleus has all the intrinsic power? No, it means nothing. The nucleus cannot exist without the outer body, nor can the outer body exist without the nucleus. In short, if gynocentrism doesn't reel, neither does patriarchy. And if gynocentrism does reel, then so does patriarchy. Yeah, at least you need to examine gynocentrism with the same intellectual rigor with which you examine patriarchy. And you would have to conclude that what you're looking at is a single dual system. It has only ever been one system, but it has been observed by two completely different sets of goggles. If anything here is real, then it's the whole thing. And it's called Panocentriarchy. Panocentriarchy. It also sounds like a country run by skin flints. <laughs> Maybe that's also how this works. <laughs> so let, let's look at where this can go from here. Many, many people think it's impossible to take this and turn it into this. Uh, not to completely undo the dual system completely, but to have something slightly closer to what the Neanderthals had. Yeah, it didn't work out for them because they had competition from us. But we have no competition left. We are the apex mammal. Going more egalitarian will not make us vulnerable to a long-lost species of gigant Gigantopithecus that's been hiding in the woods this whole time. No, we've won. We are best ape. Hands down. We can relax now. And... I'm of the opinion that this is indeed possible, because I'm of the little bit of both persuasion. I think to some degree we've taken the human nature of our biology and run with it to an unnatural place. It's possible that this looks normal to us because it's been like that for so long, even though in our natural, perhaps, hunter-gatherer state, we're actually more like this. Or just this, or whatever. It's hard, it's hard to say, obviously. Maybe we used to act like bonobos, but we had to start acting like chimps so we could get the agricultural revolution done. <laughs> because chimps may be a bit aggressive, but at least they're more efficient than bonobos, which is fucking... And maybe now 
like three revolutions later, <laughs> it might be time to to get back to being bonobos and relax. But let's look at a different outcome. What if instead of this happening with the nucleus puts a blending and fading into the outside what if the nucleus simply expands relative to, to the outside until there's scarcely anything left but pure nucleus i mean that would be you know, us giving so much protection to the women <laughs> they multiply exponentially and giving so much so-called freedom to the men that we are actively ejecting them from society, from existence, from anything resembling the safety of the cell. Can that even happen? I, yes. <laughs> this is where the analogy of celestial body, bodies and cells become somewhat redundant, because I don't think this is a property of either. It is possible in this diagram for this to happen or this. And as far as we can tell from history, this never happens. Except occasionally with wolves and what have you, but this is the pattern of every genocide. As far as primates are concerned, particularly this one. It's what happens when a tribe gets destroyed by another tribe. What you might call a patriarchal genocide is killing the women first. What you might call a gynocentric genocide is killing the men first. And killing the men first is, without a shadow of a doubt, the human race's favourite kind of genocide. That is as close as we could get to an objective fact about anything. And it would be very helpful if we could stop listening to the people who deny that. So, if there are people in your midst who claim to be trying to turn this into this, but are in fact turning it from this into this, then by all means beware those people. They are not trying to turn you into egalitarians like the Neanderthals were. They are erasing you into extinction like they did with the Neanderthals. And if you don't think people can and will do that to any people, including their own, then yeah, be prepared to have another thing coming. The symptoms to beware are in the people who only see half of the diagram, who only believe half the phenomenon exists. And you are invited to get a head count of the people who only believe in patriarchy and tally it against a head count of the people who only believe in gynocentrism. <laughs> the ratio you get might indicate to you what the large-scale nature of the problem is. I hope this has been helpful. If, like me, you're having trouble naming the problem, this is an alternative. Try visualizing the situation. Try seeing the problems without naming them. I don't know. It's, it's what we did for millions of years before we invented complex verbal language. Before we discovered lies, all we had was light and sound. And tactility, I suppose, but ah, it's internet, one step at a time. <laughs> oh, see you later, y'all. Draw things. It's fun. <laughs>